as the raindrops fell from the smoke-filled black satanic skies of Victoria and Manchester that landed on the faces of two men. Two men that were sons of the city. Identical in many ways, but bipolar opposites in others. Jekyll to the Hyde. Ying to the Yang. The flip side of the coin. Meet Jerome Caminada and Bob Horridge. Both men were born shortly after the cholera pandemic, which ravished through the city on an unprecedented scale. Almost as if the Grim Reaper himself was knocking door to door and claiming the souls of the unfortunate. Caminada came from poverty, the son of immigrants that fled to Manchester for work and a better way of life. His mother was Irish and his dad was Italian. He witnessed the boom of the industrial revolution unfold before his very eyes. The chimneys, the factories, the blood, sweat and tears. He witnessed the pubs and the drinking dens that led to the demise of many men and women and the violence that came with it. He witnessed the criminals that terrorised the streets of which he was bored on. Deansgate, regarded at the time as the heart of Victorian Manchester's crime world. Waking up to the shouts and the screams from the drunken punters as they exchanged words and fought like wild dogs down the dimly lit back streets of Victorian Manchester. All for the entertainment of the baying crowd that salivated at the sight of blood like a pack of wild hyenas. After witnessing all this pandemonium, is it any wonder why Caminada wanted to change the city that he lived in? Trying to put right the wrongs that he saw as a child. He joined the police force at the age of 24 and he quickly flew through the ranks. He was responsible for the imprisonment of around 1,225 criminals and seeing the closure of around 400 pubs. Word was spreading far and wide as he struck a chill down the spine of every living criminal Victorian. But it was at a cost as he became a target and his life was constantly in danger. Hence why he carried around with him a Colt Lightning revolver at all times. His detective work was eccentric, against the grain to your traditional policing. He delved into the psychology of the criminal, which had never been seen before. He studied the movement of a fugitive, the way they walked, mannerisms, characteristics. He analysed the data that he collected and he met regularly with his network of informants. And not to forget, Jerome had a photographic memory. Is it any wonder why he inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to write his most famous books? Sherlock Holmes. Sparning from the slums. A little over a mile away was a man so ruthless that it would stop at nothing. From jumping in Manchester's waterways, 
to hiding in the bridges, lunging through the attic spaces of the back-to-back -back terraced houses and scaling the rooftops, even shooting his way through two police officers, all for the sake of not to be captured. Meet Bob, Horridge, Manchester's public enemy, number one. Do you think I'm scared of coming on? That idiot that they keep writing about in the paper. <laughs> I'd wipe the floor with him. Ironically, Bob was born just a stone's throw away from the infamous Strangeways prison where Bob would spend most of his time throughout his life. Like Caminada, he came from a respectable family. His dad was a whitesmith making fenders for fireplaces, and he would work all the hours God could send. Like Caminada, Bob witnessed the industrial revolution play out before him. He witnessed the drunkards in the pubs, the violence, the carnage, the chaos. The hunger, poverty. But whereas Caminada chose to make a difference to the city, Bob went down the other road. And he joined the gangs that congregated on the street corners, waiting to bump into the rival gangs, declaring war upon him, like something from a medieval battle. Wild, fearless, reckless. Shouting and screaming, incandescent with rage, with nothing to lose and all to gain. Fighting with the makeshift weapons and fists, and not forgetting the sound of the belt buckle as it whipped and lashed against the faces of the rival gang. Organised chaos. He did, however, start life as a blacksmith, a profession that he excelled in. He was clever, gifted with his hands, working in the heat of the molten metal, comfort zone, but he was also known for his dodgy dealings on the side. I'm telling you, half past ten. And like most criminals, enough is never enough. And he was attracted to the criminal underworld, like a moth to a flame. But as the years rolled on, the crimes became more serious and daring. From domestic violence on his wife, to an organised hit on a jeweller's Bob was in deep. He was calculated. He was the pipe piper of his gang of thieves. The flip side of the coin. So here I am, Angel Meadow once again. How can I keep coming here and doing these stories? You'd think it'd be all over, wouldn't you? But it's not for the one to come in here, even though I do like it. It's the stories that drag me and bring me here. And this one's a fascinating one between Jerome Caminado and Bob Horridge, Manchester's public enemy number one back in the Victorian era. And the reason why I'm here today is, obviously, this was um, quite pivotal to to Bob Horridge and, and Jerome Caminada in a way. Um, now Bob, like I said, you probably already know about this in the beginning of the story, but he was, came from like outside Strangeways. 
and uh, just over there where we're going to go in a minute is Ludgate Hill. Ludgate Hill is known as Bob Horridge's hideout um, and this is a place where Bob would spend a lot of time and he would evade the police uh, very craftily around there. Um, but he had a bit of a close scrape. One of his first, I think it was his first encounter with Jerome Caminado happened on Ludgate Hill. And that's the reason why we're going there today. But this park, it just keeps spewing out these stories. And um, the story, uh, one of the main things is why I'm here today as well, is that, you know, I've delved into it many times before about the poverty that this place possessed. Um, just literally right behind me now would have been St. Michael's Church. Um, another incredible, incredible piece of history that is, is now long forgotten in Manchester. But like I say, this whole part, this was um, this was basically a fighting ground. Now, all the terraced houses that would have been here packed up. You know the story and you've seen it probably in the previous videos which I've delved into a lot more. But the terraced houses that were here and the pubs and the drinking dens. Now, you know, this place was a hive of activity, a hive of poverty. The sewage that would have came from the river Irk from slopping out, the smell coming over from the market of the rotten fish. You know, these, they were selling fruit, veg, uh, meat and fish, but they were all rotten. It wasn't like they could get fresh produce around here. Um, but like I said, this, this was filled with terrace streets back to back. This was war ground. Now, going back a couple of hundred years, Angel Meadow was notorious, not just for its, for how dangerous it were, and not just because of what was here. It was known for, a, um, if anybody had a dispute, whether you was arguing in the mill, whether you were arguing in a pub, you had a dispute with a neighbor, you had a dispute with a rival gang, anything, it was settled on this turf. And um, I was reading a few weeks back that this place once was filled out of about 500 people with two fellas going at it and they knocked lumps out of each other. But I've just spotted something now. I'm gonna take you over to this. I'm sorry, it looks a lovely day, doesn't it? But it's actually quite chilly. Um, so if you get any bit of a wind interference, um, I do apologize. But I've just noticed now, remember last time I came here and I was over in the corner and I shown you that gray stone that was under the tree and the root looked like it had been pushed up. walking on this now this bit where I am now where I'm stood this would have been all headstones and um, flags on the floor of the, the poor people that are buried below me but I've just noticed this if I can get the camera the right way there is what looks like some sort of headstone or flag work um, just poking out the ground and where this tree I'm trying to do this while I can't see the camera but basically where this tree is here it's uprooted and here where my hand is is a another piece of possibly headstone um, and like I say things just keep I can come here one month to the next and there's just something new to constantly constantly show you and I've just clocked some over there too it's quite sinister but I'll put that in the video later on so without further ado I'm gonna head over now to Ludgate Hill which was Bob Horridge's hideout and the first time that Caminado and Horridge locked arms. So after doing a bit of research on Bob Horridge, it's clear to see he started out life as a bit of a cat burglar. Um, started into petty crime like most criminals do, which then escalated into organized crime with him and his gang. And literally, like I say, he started out, he was your stereotypical sort of cat burglar. Um, he operated elusively at nighttime and um, 
as the years went on the crime got more and more severe and he would rob jewelers um, and stuff like that but I was reading one of his first altercations that he had with Caminada when they came face to face even though they grew up in a you know only a few hundred yards or a few thousand yards from one another they must have crossed paths well before as kids maybe but one of his first altercations is Caminada um, got a tip off that all these boxes from um, some sort of wholesales were going missing and it led him to Ludgate Hill where I am and he traced it back and he confronted Caminado on the uh, sorry he confronted Bob Orridge which then led from a bit of a conversation to the pair of them having a right a good old scrap and rather than run away he would try and fight her and that's what uh, unless he was outnumbered by multiple police but he would have a row and he'd have a scrap with her now in this altercation when they locked arms it led to Caminada having a tussle with him and then they, you know they went at it for a bit but Caminada eventually got the better of him and he pinned him down and arrested him but ever since that day that was the day where they became nemesis is is that the right word nemesis is they became rivals let's say um and obviously it was his first this was the first time he'd properly been arrested he'd been out of prison all his life but this was the first time he got quite a lengthy sentence and it was because of Caminada so since that day Bob Orridge had a bit of a bee in his bonnet about Caminada but it was the first time that they locked horns and it happened right here on this well on the street behind me here but I mean today you look at it and I'm quite impressed some of the old factories are still up and it is nice to see um, and you know reading about this area the drinking dens the poverty which we've also touched on um, they had things like cat gut factories cat gut factories tanneries um, this here in front of me the tobacco factory this place was just full of mills spinning mills after spinning mill and the pollution if you think it's bad when you go around somewhere now and you get a smell of something imagine what this place was like with all these factories just pumping out and kicking out work smoke smog you're inhaling it you're not only you're inhaling it you're smelling it every single day on top of the rotten smell coming from the markets with all the food so yeah i mean we're a far cry today from what it were but everywhere you look i love it around here because you see little glimpses of the past little streets that you thought wonder if that, that must have been up when bob orridge was alive like this must have been up when Caminata, around where Caminata lived it's like when I walk onto Angel Meadow little street signs Aspen Lane, Irk Street, St Michael's Place they're just there and they're pieces it's like flipping back in a book and looking at a piece of I don't know like a piece like, like just a little hidden piece of Manchester that is still there from that day and um, that's what really gets my brain ticking and I have to delve into it more but like I say Ludgate Hill absolutely pivotal to the story Angel Meadow stomping ground for a lot of fights and a lot of I can guarantee you that uh, Bob Orridge would have been chased right through Angel Meadow and like I say just a straight dash from here to Strangeways is where, where he was born you know absolutely fascinating In 1870, the pair crossed paths once again, as a man was robbed for his watch outside the train station, and after reporting the incident to the police, the victim gave a detailed description of his watch. Although it was beautiful, and worth quite a bit of money, it was in fact broken, and it had a large knife scratch across the face. Caminada quickly got to work and he met with his network of close-knit informants who was his extra set of ears and eyes on the cold cobble streets of Manchester. A tip-off soon pricked the ear of Caminada, which only led him to one man, Bob Horridge. And unbeknown to Bob, he was being stalked. And as he was leaving the watchmakers, awaiting him on the other side of the door, was Detective Jerome Caminada. Right, Bob. This time, Bob's luck had run out. 
and a lengthy sentence awaited him. He received seven years in prison, followed by another seven years of police supervision. But whilst incarcerated, he was plotting a plan to escape. He had it all mapped out to perfection. All the bases was covered. When that security guard clocks off at half but little did Bob know. He'd been overheard by one of the police guards as he was bragging to his fellow inmates and as Bob made a run for it. The alarm was quickly raised and two shots was fired which penetrated the target, leaving Bob lying in a pool of his own blood. Bob was left licking his wounds in his rat infested cell. His pride was dented, embarrassed, alone. Whilst on the other side of the jailhouse wall, Mr. Caminada was being praised for his excellent detective work and he began to make a name for himself off the back of people like Bob and the capture of other criminals that reigned terror on the streets of Manchester. Jerome was a name in the city and he became more powerful with each case that he cracked. Skilled, masterful, one step ahead. So here I am, another pivotal spot to this whole story. And right behind me is the beautiful hidden gem. And it's called the hidden gem um, because it's sort of nestled away, right slap bang in the heart of the city. You had this old school, ancient <laughs> looking church. And I'm telling you now inside, it's absolutely breathtaking. It reminds me of something from like the Vatican City. Now this is vital to the whole story because this is where Jerome Caminado would have met up with his network of informants and on the back pew he would have discussed what was going on, who the criminals were after, what bits of information he would have got out of them. And like uh, I was thinking, it, it was probably a bit of a safe spot for him. He probably felt safe that he was in you know, a church, nothing really goes wrong in a church does it? Um, so he would have felt comforted coming here and felt like he could meet up with these people that were on the streets that were acting as criminals and befriending criminals to get information out of them. Uh, but I'll show you, pan you down the sides, there's like little passageways and back streets and in the back of your mind you could still imagine how it would have been back in the day. And just to be, walk, like to, to be walking around this area, knowing that he stepped up them steps and he went in the same place that I'm going to go in now. Um, it's quite surreal, it really is. But yeah, this is where Jerome Caminado came to discuss the criminal underworld. Should we have a look in? Let's go. surreal but what I'll do I'll pan you around me 
this journey now and just show you the beauty of it because it's breathtaking. What a place. Can you even imagine the type of conversations that would have gone in there? You know, they would have been discussing people like Bob Orridge and trying to bring down the Scuttlers. Absolutely, so nostalgic. And it gives me this, it's really strange, but you get this like weird tingly feeling because you're in a place that is, of, of, you know, stumbling a bit <laughs> you're in a place of historical significance and when you read about places like this and then actually visit them it sort of sinks in these streets that i'm walking on today caminada would have walked down there and you know his network of informants would have then fled off into the night and scuttled away <laughs> and he would have probably been wearing you know clothing that would have made him fit in around here um, he would have had to have disguised himself walking down the streets because he was a target, wasn't he? Um, but he was streetwise. Caminada was a Deansgate kid. So he he wasn't wet behind the ears. He was as he was as sneaky and as smart as the rest of these streetwise people. And I think that's what gave Caminada the edge. He knew how they worked because he grew up with them, but he just chose a different path in life. But to think of some of the conversations that have gone in and there, it's absolutely mind-blowing. So, just wanted to say an absolute massive, massive thank you and a huge shout out to a lad called Liam on Instagram. He contacted me on Instagram. What I'll do, Liam, I'll leave you um, a account under here, mate, and um, I'll leave a link in the description. In the description. Um, if everyone can, just go over and give give Liam a follow. Um, he's a he's, he's photographer. He's absolutely amazing. And he messaged me out the blue and, and Liam, I really don't know how you've clocked this mate because I've filmed on this bridge many times and I did not see it. So you must eat your carrots, mate. That's all I can say. Um, so Liam contacted me on Instagram and he, he was taking photographs around here, around Angel Meadow. And he messaged me, he went, Ant, what do you reckon this is? And how old do you think it is? And soon as I seen it, I couldn't believe it. My jaw just hit the floor. And I thought, this is gold. This is gold. I've had um, the story of Bob Orridge to, to tell for a bit, but nothing was there to sort of give me that kick up the, the ass. You know what I mean? To get me out and film it. And when he sent me this, I just literally, it, my jaw hit the floor. And what I'm gonna show you now is a piece of, I would say it's a piece of graffiti from the Victorian era. And, um, inscribed into the bridge wall is the word horridge and i couldn't believe it and liam clocked it and he sent it to me so i, I can't even thank you enough mate because really without it without you doing that this video probably wouldn't be possible um and he messaged me and, and when I, i'm looking back at it and i went over and had a look and i thought wow it's chiseled into the actual wall now this isn't like someone scratched the name this is it looks almost like it's like a bit of calligraphy um, and it's written in old the, the, you'll know what I mean the scroll of the R is something that we don't do anymore now we like as a kid you know you'd write your name on a wall or you tag your name on a, a lamppost like Ant was here and I think that this is the exact same and it says the word Horridge right across the bridge and with Horridge being so evasive and spending time around here and jumping, this is literally a little bridge that would have just dropped straight into a 
think it's the River Irk. Now, this must have been a place where Bob spent quite a bit of time, long enough for him to actually start writing his name and, and scratching it into this wall. But I'm gonna show it you now, I can't. <laughs> I've just been and seen it and I couldn't believe it. So I'm gonna shut up and I'm gonna take you over to it now. So this is the, the bridge here and I'll have to speak up a little bit because it is getting windy. Um, but if you look on this wall here right before you, H-O-R-R-I-D-G-E, a horridge. Isn't that absolutely amazing? And this is a piece of Manchester history that's just slipped the net. And I'm not trying to glorify Bob Horridge in any way, but it's, it's just one of them things that makes me it's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Basically, it's one of them things that just blows my mind. And if you look at the top here, there's other names that have been B, is it G-U-Y? Now, is that bad guy or something? I don't know. Is it one of these? These, to me, look like they're um, the, the other gang members that have done their name. A, look at the A on that. Dale, that it says. And then something, it's like an N, double E something me and look at that look at the j there look at the swirl this is absolutely flawless like old sort of calligraphy and you have to be skilled to actually do stuff like this because this is like long forgotten stuff we don't do anymore you know to that to that level but to see the name horridge on this wall and this is a place like i say look what appears over the top of it we look into the background there we've got Strange Ways, Strange Ways Prison, a place where he was born, and then we've got this on the wall. And look at all this. I come out this way. We have Angel Meadow, and straight up this street, we've got Ludgate Hill. But let me just take you over here, because, like I say, Bob would evade, be evasive if he'd jump away it, uh, from the police, and there's no risk that he would have uh, not taken. Look at the age on that bridge. Now today, look at this, the river, yeah? Now it is, it's a mess, isn't it? But back in the day, this would have been a hell of a lot worse. Um, but it's just somewhere that you could imagine Bob escaping to with it only being a short drop down. You know, I bet he stood here for hours and he was, he was sort of waiting for things to happen. And like I say, when the police would come, one of Bob's methods was just jumping straight in and it's only a shallow little drop that. Maybe he hid under there while the police ran across here at one point. But yeah, this is absolute gold dust to me. This is this is everything. Um, and like I say, I'm not trying to glorify the crime. I'm just basically fascinated by a remnant that is still here today from that time period. And the guy that I'm actually covering has actually put his name directly into that wall and unquestionably that says Horridge and I seriously do think these were possibly like gang members so if you can um, make out any of these other names you know drop them in the in the comment section but unquestionably H-O-R-R-I-D-G-E Horridge so <laughs> It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? And can you just imagine the stories that this little river has too? And look at the old buildings here. These would have been the old factory walls and all of the remnants of the bricks and the brickworks have all fell into this river from what was actually here all those years ago. The fingerprints of the past, literally. As the years rolled forward, we see Bob commit many crimes, but somehow gets away with it. He was tried for malicious damage, even destroying the bellows of a rival blacksmith. He broke into a shop, stealing all the jewellery from the safe. He was out of control, Do you think I'm scared of coming a law to himself, <laughs> and coming harder. I've got was feeling the pressure. Horridge was starting to get the better of him. He'd learnt from his rookie mistakes as a small-time crook, 
And Bob was a force on the cobbles now. I'm the man on these cobbles. I own Manchester. Leaving the police in his shadows. One step ahead. But in 1887, the two would meet for the very last time. The final showdown. Horridge was spotted robbing a shoe shop by a policeman on the beat. And as he tried to make the arrest, Bob glanced up, took one step back, and loaded up his revolver. He fired a bullet which grazed the neck of the officer, sending him straight to the floor. A whistle was blown for backup. A second officer came immediately to the scene, only to be met by the bullet of Bob Orridge. As he fired another shot, hitting the officer straight through the chest. Bob fled the scene and went into hiding. Word spread fast, and Kaminada was instructed by a hierarchy to run Bob Orridge into the ground. So the detective work began. The informants were scuttling around the city, ear to the floor. They searched the streets of Angel Meadow, Burke Street and Aspen Lane. They checked the hideouts, pubs and drinking dens, and shook a few people down along the way. But nothing came of it. Bob knew the hunt was on for him. And there was knocking door to door, smoking out the rat. Feeling the heat, Bob fled the sir. He was an outcast. And he headed for Liverpool. Only to be followed by Jerome Caminada, who was dressed in disguise. And in the midst of the crowd, Caminada spotted him. He'd analysed Bob's movement over the years. Walking with a limp, possibly from being shot back when he tried to escape from jail all those years before. He stood out like a sore thumb, and Caminada smelt blood. He zoned in on Bob, and when the moment came, he pulled out his loaded revolver and buried the muzzle of the gun into the head of Bob and whispered in his ear, if there's any nonsense from you, you'll get the contents of this. Horridge was also armed. Acting swiftly, Bob crashed and wrestled with Caminada. Which erupted in pure pandemonium. But the battle was lost. Bob was apprehended. And he was sentenced to life in prison. So although it's pretty quiet at the minute around here, um, this was a slum area back when Bob Orridge was growing up as a kid. And even though he came from a respectable family, they had nothing. Um, but he went down the wrong path and he got in with a real bad crowd of people and ultimately the rest of his life was paved out that way really. But he literally lived around these streets. He would have been all terraced uh, housing, factories, everything. And ironically, he was born here, right behind me. If I can get the camera right, there's uh, Strangeways Prison. And ultimately that's where he spent quite a bit of time. But yeah, like I say, it is quite run down this area of Manchester, but I bet it's it a bit of far cry from what it was back in the day, because it was a place of absolute poverty. Right, so I'm just sort of making my way towards Angel Meadow. And um, I had a little bit of a think when I was wandering around the streets where, where Bob grew up. I was having a bit of a wonder. Um, and I just thought, God, what happens if Bob will have, wouldn't have fell into these street gangs, wouldn't have fell into crime? You know, he would have been, he was clearly an exceptionally clever person. He outsmarted Caminada a few times, but you know, he was clearly a talented person. 
in what he did when he wasn't a criminal, you know. Um, and he came from a pretty decent background, but all I can think of um, back in the day, I think Bob would have been born just before the scuttling era um, as a kid. So, but there will have nevertheless, there will have still been scuttling gangs or, or gangs like the scuttlers, I should say. And like um, I've said previously, these gangs didn't let up. If you didn't join their gang, they would make your life absolute hell and misery. Um, they would beat you on a daily basis. They would hound you until you joined the gang because the more people that they were, the more force there were. There was more of a force for a um, against a rival gang. So like I said, it would have made his life hell. And maybe that was the result of what how Bob ended up getting into um, the life of crime and being dragged in you know, down the wrong road. But on the flip side, in my head, I'm thinking, God, he could have uh, made a decent living and he could have been someone because he was clearly, clearly talented. It was such a shame, innit? This is what happens sometimes when you can, you know, you get in the wrong crowd. But yeah, maybe that was a, it was a, it could have been another story of how great Bob were rather than the one I'm covering today. So I'm going to throw this in quickly and I did say to you at the beginning of the video that I will show you something quite sinister in this park. Now when I came here last time I filmed the scuttlers or not the last time, the time before I filmed the scuttlers in here and I'll put a clip in now. So I've just been sat here on this bench here and I thought I'd add this in now these slabs here that you can see just look like normal like slabs you know like old paving slabs but if just notice this on the side did a little groove there and it's like a swirl and a almost looks like this could have been an old headstone and I thought no it can't be an headstone surely it can't be um, but it was blank and it looked like maybe it was a template that they didn't use for a headstone um, and they've used it as a bit of casing as a bit of protection around the park bench anyway the months rolled on and a fella got in touch with me and he said to me and go back he went, I'm telling you now, these are headstones. And I've just come to the park now, and I can't believe it, but they actually are headstones from, possibly these were the old flags that were down here when this place was a, you know, a mass burial yard. Now, it's just a constant reminder of, just to have like a tree in this park, considering the history that it has, just to have a tree in the park is, you know it's come on leaps and bounds and it's filled with these massive buildings and it's a green space but the clutches of its past still still rear its face from time to time and i'm just going to show you now exactly what i've just seen so here i was sort of sat minding my own business having a brew and as you can see these this stonework these flags and um we can see the the marking but if we peel back the vines and the weeds there is actual dates and names of you know these were the people that once lived and died in angel meadow and that says 1830 something um also departed 1835 so you know this is it's really it's really sinister because i don't think i think it's slightly i don't think it's slightly i think it is quite disrespectful that they're using these to prop up a you know a bit where you have a brew because these are actual headstones of people that they 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 walked the land before us and you know they had it tough and they lived and died on angel meadow And now it's propping up a bit of a, a 
park bench so you can have a brew um, but it's very sinister and it doesn't sit well with me that because these poor people they, they had it tough um, and they would have probably have got them headstones that was all on this park here all like lay flat all the way down um, but like I say it really doesn't sit well with me that so to see stuff like that um, it goes against the grain with me um, and I know that you have to move on and you have to make like what they've done to the parks absolutely amazing you know it's a bit of a green space one of the only green spaces in Manchester but there is no nod to our ancestral past here it's almost like they're trying to erase what happened here and I totally get it I do get it because you have to move on from things I get that and considering how bad it were but these are our ancestral roots these are our forefathers and um, they lived and died on this this land where I am now the streets and the houses around here they lived and died on it and what they represented is the heart the hardship that they went through just to eke some sort of existence like a, a, they tried the best I know they got dragged into the drinking culture and there was a lot of violence and but what else was there to do for him? What, what, how are they supposed to sustain a, a normal life coming out of the struggles that was around here? Um, but for what they went through and the hardship that they went through to then propping up like the park bench where you have a bit of a brute and that was someone's flagstone. Um, it just goes against the grain. And like this little bit here, you know, you come walking, your dog or whatever, and the past sort of raised its head and this featured on my uh, video uh, about a year ago now but as you can see here the rest of, of Thomas W-I-D-D -D, so whatever his last name were there 1801 Dean Kirby's book I'll plug it now because Dean Kirby's book changed my perception of Angel Meadow um, and what you, I'll plug it, he's not asked me to do this, so it's not like um, a sponsor or anything like that, but credit where credit's due, Dean Kirby's book on Angel Meadow absolutely blew my mind. Um, and what I'll do, I'll leave the link to his, uh, so you can go and get his book, I'll leave it in the description. And if you want to know more about Angel Meadow and his past, go and read his book. It's at each page, you can't put the book down, it's addictive. But by Dean writing that book, you know, his, his parents, uh, sorry, his great great grandparents and everything lived on the streets behind uh, where I am now. And it should be like an honorary what he's done for this, to write a, a scripture like that. And it should be preserved. Um, and it should have won, won all the awards because that sort of, that's what, what, Dean did he's basically highlighted everything into great great detail so like I say I'll leave the link below to his book and if you want it go and get it I advise that you get it um, but yeah like the underbelly of Angel Meadow no matter what you do to it the underbelly of what was here is still very much here if you just look a little bit harder History is imperative to our identity. Our genetic makeup is moulded from the underbelly of the soil. And the people who are buried below it, the ones who walk the earth before us, they represented the struggles, the sorrow, the heartache and pain, love, compassion, empathy. But other words can be described to someone like Bob. Was he someone who was just misunderstood? Or a ruthless individual with a wicked streak in him? A true outlaw? Or a byproduct of his surroundings, a result of hunger, poverty, 
and desperation. These are the conditions which can see a good man turn bad and under different circumstance we might have been talking about him in a different light who knows I'll let you decide Jerome led a very successful career and he retired at the top of his game in 1899 he died in 1914 at his home in Mossside, aged 70 years old. It's believed a bus accident in North Wales the previous year played a factor in his decline in health and eventually his death. He was survived by his wife Amelia, the love of his life and the children. Although Amelia was never the same after losing her husband, as her heart was broken and she was marred by grief, she died from infection in 1929 and is buried in Southern Cemetery next to her beloved husband, Detective Jerome Caminada. But Bob, on the other hand, was a bit of a mystery. His police report stated that Bob was five foot seven inches tall, with dark brown hair and bluey grey eyes. His face was pockmarked, and he had deep scars on his knuckles, brought on by all the street fighting that he was involved in. In 1891, he was 56 years old, and he was still an inmate. His health was considered as fair, but his left arm was paralysed and he walked with a cane. He was released from prison after serving 20 years behind bars, most of it in solitary confinement. His then wife Jane had passed away and Bob was well in his 60s. But it wasn't long before he found himself another companion. She was called Annie Morin, who was 47 years old, and he later married her. His occupation was noted as a master engineer, which sounded very fitting, given his safe breaking past. But the final report on Bob was in 1911, which stated that he lived in Cheetham with Anna and he was working as a peddler, a far fall from Grace. Any more information about Bob has been lost in the mist of time. His death, and where his final resting place is, is unknown. Buried somewhere within the chapters of the past, never to be seen again. But what happened that day back in 1870 will always be in the history books. The story of a true cat and mouse tale. Sons of the city that the raindrops over Manchester will never, never. Kiss. kiss again. again, again. So it's a week on, and you're probably thinking, God, this looks professional, doesn't it? He's actually propped his camera up and he's not holding it. But I've come back because I had a bit of an idea. So after me seeing the horridge sign on the wall, I went mental in Hobbycraft or whatever it were. The works at Hobbycraft. And I bought some charcoal pencils. And just to be even weirder, bought myself some blank paper. And what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna sort of trace it and I'm gonna try and make out the names a bit more clearer. So without further ado, let's get over there. 
I feel like a guy off heart attack. Well, that was a big fat fail, wasn't it? Because that is what I got. I think the paper's too thick, but 10 out of 10 for effort, I'll give myself. <laughs> I couldn't draw a straight line with a ruler, no joke. Um, so I think I'll leave the artwork to people like Bob Ross. See you in a bit. <laughs>